place of covenant with him. The message we have today is actually going to be a three-part message. And if you know me very well, you know that I'm not much of a series pastor. There are a lot of pastors that like to teach in series. And that's all they teach is one series, then they'll go into another series. I rarely teach series pastors. But there are times where the message is not able to be done in one message. And as we look at the prodigal son, I want to divide this parable up into three sections. And I want to focus on the three main characters of this parable. The first will be the prodigal himself. The second will be the older son. And the third will be the father. And I can tell you that I've been in the church most of my life, as have most of you, and I suspect you have probably heard preaching on the prodigal son dozens if not hundreds of times. Why we continue to go back to this parable is because it speaks to us. And there are times when really we have to examine the parable and we have to put ourselves in the shoes of that parable. And this day, I want to look at this parable from the point of view of that young prodigal son. To know that, in fact, I have been that prodigal son on too many occasions. And in fact, there are times when I probably am, in fact, still the prodigal son. So as we focus today, we want to consider how this applies to us. The scripture today is Luke 15, 11 through 24. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided the property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and there began to be a need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, for no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you, or against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him felt compassion, and ran out, embraced, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, and shoes on his feet, and bring a fatted calf, and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found." They began to celebrate. Now, we in this modern day and age may not realize how shocking this story was when Jesus told it. Because when Jesus was telling this to a people that were used to their society, what this son was actually saying by giving me my inheritance was saying to his father's face, I wish you were dead. There is no value in you except what I'm going to get from you, and I can't wait for you to die so I can have my share. So this son's request is a bit more shocking in Jesus' time than it is in ours, but I think it is true even in today's society when you see families that split over inheritances, that the attitude is not long gone. We still want what we think we as deserved to be ours. And in that society, being the younger son, this boy understood his place. His older brother, being the firstborn, would get two-thirds of the estate and would always be in charge of the estate when dad died. The younger son would get one-third 
and would be subject to his brother as his boss. So this younger brother is looking at the situation and going, I don't see any part of this that I want. I want to live my own life. I want to do my own thing. And I want to be my own person. And so I want my money now. And I am not being part of this anymore. I'm going to get out of here and enjoy my life. An attitude I would have to tell you is pretty predominant still today. The old hedonistic attitude of the Greeks, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, is still alive and well. People will tell you, there's good jokes. He who dies with the most toys wins. You've all heard that. There is this attitude that all there is to this life is what you can get out of it and what you can get to enjoy. And this younger son is certainly in that attitude. And so he does take the money he gets, and instead of reinvesting it in the farm like he should have as a good younger brother, he goes to a foreign country and he squanders it. And I love the way that Jesus said, he basically wasted every dime he had. He literally spent every dime. And he had lots of friends while he had money. There were tons of people that wanted to party with him while he had money. But it's ironic that about the same time his money ran out, there gets to be a famine. And have you ever been in a situation where you went from the old story of rags to riches? That's not too hard to deal with. But when you go from riches to rags, I'm here to tell you, folks, there's people who cannot deal with that. And this young man is going through just that. He had all the money he wanted for a brief minute and then it ran out and suddenly he went from being able to do whatever he wanted to not even be able to feed himself he came into a position where he was in as low as you can get and again we're talking about Jesus telling this story to his fellow Jews to you and me I have worked on a hog farm Dave knows what it's like to work on a hog farm. We don't see the repulsiveness of working with hogs. But for a Jew to be diminished to feeding hogs, this is the lowest place you can be. The hogs were a detestable animal to the Jews. This man is in the field feeding hogs, so he can't find a lower job. They would probably have found a sewer job higher ranking than working with hogs. And not only is he working with hogs that Jews detest, but he's feeding these hogs basically what they call carob pods. They're a tree that grows over there, and it's basically livestock food. And he's so hungry that he's looking at those pods and going, hmm, whatever those pigs don't eat, I think I'm going to eat. He's in a bad way. And I suspect that as the prodigal son starts to see reality stinking in on him, he had to question whether or not he was being punished. He was, in fact, not living a very fun life. And I love how the, Jesus points out that he came to a realization that in his father's house, even his servants ate well. And he realized, I really blew it. I have messed up. I took my father, told him I wished he was dead, and now I've squandered what he gave me, and I'm starving. So he gets this attitude that, well, I guess I'll go back, admit that I was wrong, and say I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but will you take me on as a servant? What that prodigal is doing is saying, I'm really sorry. Now, I can tell you as a police officer, I've heard a lot of criminals tell me they were sorry. But I always had to question, are you sorry that you're sitting across the table from me in handcuffs and got caught? Or are you sorry because what you did was wrong and you see what you did was wrong? There is a difference, you know. 
This prodigal did something wrong, and he was willing to admit he was not expecting any sympathy. He was not expecting any breaks. He wasn't going to blame it on somebody else. He wasn't going to find an excuse or a rationalization or a way to minimize what he did was wrong. He went back to his father saying, I blew it. And I don't even deserve to be called your son anymore. Hire me as a servant because I do not deserve. And in today's society, that is almost a taboo. To take responsibility for your own actions is almost impossible. Because you see, there's always a reason. It's always somebody else's fault. You know, I grew up in an alcoholic family and everybody drank. My brothers all drank. And of course, you can sit there and go, well, it's not my fault. It's just the family tradition. Who was the country western singer that, uh, I can't think of his name now, Hank, Hank Williams. You know, it's, it's a family tradition. We're just keeping up the way the family does it. That's a way of not taking responsibility for your own actions. It's like saying, well, you know, I really couldn't help myself. It just is the way we are. I can't tell you how many people I meet that are angry. They go, you don't understand. That's just the way my family is. We're angry people. We get angry. We can't help it. Well, I'm here to tell you, you can. And as long as you continue to use an excuse, I guarantee you, you will not change. I can always find some reason why my sin isn't as bad as someone else's. Say I cheat on my taxes. Well, you know, I only did a little bit. And you look at these rich folks, you know they're doing a lot more. So it, it doesn't matter that I cheated on my tax. I can honestly tell you the IRS will have a different opinion of that. If they catch you cheating on your taxes, even for 25 cents, they're going to come talk to you. And they're going to tell you. And you can't rationalize, you can't minimalize your sin and get right with God. The prodigal is in a position where he knows he has blown it. And repentance is what the prodigal is. And what he shows us is a perfect example. While he's in that field feeding those hogs, he is repulsed by what he has done. His words saying that I am not worthy to be called my father's son anymore says, I blew it. I took responsibility. He admitted exactly what he had done. He admitted to being a fool. And I don't know about you, but that's not an easy thing to do. When you make a mistake, it's a whole lot easier to say, well, you know, there's, I, my chief had an, a sign on the back of his wall. It says, I once thought I made a mistake, but it was, turns out I was wrong. We have that way of thinking. We don't want to admit when we're wrong or we make a mistake. We want to find someone else to blame. We want to minimize it. We want to do anything but come clean and say, here's what we have. And the prodigal son gives us a beautiful picture of what it looks like to repent. He went back to his father, not expecting any mercy. He went back to his father expecting to be rejected. He was going to beg to be a servant just so he could get back and eat. He did not feel he had any right to be still called a son. That's an attitude that we must look at when we consider that we are repentant. I hear too many people tell me, yes, I'm repentant. I, don't, I reject what I did until I feel like doing it again. And then I'm going to do it again. And that's not repentance. That's like the crook sitting across from me in handcuffs going, I'm sorry I got caught. Hopefully next time I can go longer without being caught. And another example that you see in the Bible 
of what I call perfect repentance is David. David was the king of Israel. He had everything. God was blessing him. And one day he went up on a roof, saw another man's wife, and he did some bad things. In fact, he not only slept with that woman, but when he couldn't cheat, trick her husband into going in with her so he could mistake that, he had her husband killed. David was a despicable human being at this point. In a lot of senses, I'd have to say, I'd look at David and go, I don't believe he deserves to be forgiven. And in real truth, he doesn't. David really doesn't deserve. He's a nasty, rotten guy at this point. That's an interesting point for me to make about somebody else. It gets a very uncomfortable when I go look in the mirror and say, I am that rotten, terrible person that does not deserve to be forgiven. I can judge David pretty easily for his sin. But when it comes to mine, I want to rationalize. And when David was confronted with his sin, he wrote a couple of psalms. And the one I want to read to you today is Psalms 51. And this was written almost directly after being confronted by Nathan. He is praying to God. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your word and blameless in your judgment. David is saying, I deserve death. I deserve death. And he was not trying to be, mince words. Verse 5 says, But behold, I brought forth iniquity, and in sin and my mother did conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in a secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take me not from your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltless, O God. O God of my salvation, my tongue will sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth that will declare your praise. For I will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good in Zion to your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in right, right sacrifices. In burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then bowls will be offered on your altar. Do you notice the similarities between David's attitude and the prodigals? They're truly sorry. They truly regret. They truly look at themselves with the same attitude. I am a fool. I have done things that are, make me worthy of being rejected by God. But I love the, what David says. Please forgive me so that I can tell others. You know, there's a lot of folks that look at the church today and call us a bunch of hypocrites. Because we're claiming that you should live a certain life. And people are watching us and going, don't see it. I see a lot of things, but I don't see true Christianity there. To be honest with you folks, the day you start looking to me and telling me that you're my example of being sinless, you're in trouble. I am a sinner. No different than you. No more or no less in need of forgiveness. 
What David is saying, however, is when I get right with God, when my sins are washed clean, when I see God saying, I'll take that slate and I'll clean it and make you whiter than snow, I can then tell others the good news. You live in a world full of people going to hell. That is the reality. That is unfortunately where you are today. The Bible says the way to heaven is narrow and few will go. The way to hell is wide and many will travel it. I would suggest to you that very many of the people that you know are headed for hell. And they're headed to hell because they believe they've blown it too much. I have shared the news of Jesus with many people who tell me this one stop. You know, Rick, that sounds really good, but God could never, ever forgive what I've done. That simple statement is the realization that they really did blow it. And I'm here to tell you that's the first step. Until you get to that point, until you get to a point where you say, look, what I have done should not be forgiven. I deserve hell. Then, if you haven't accepted that, you can't accept forgiveness. The prodigal tells his father, I am worthless. I did despicable things. I wished you were dead. And I took your money and I wasted it stupidly. I do not deserve to be your son. That is what repentance looks like. Until I can come before God and say, God, I don't deserve to be forgiven. I can't be forgiven. The good news is, I never let it in there. When they say, you don't understand, Rick, I've done too much bad. God can't forgive me. I said, yes, he can. Because whatever you've done, someone else has done even worse. And God has forgiven them. We have a God who says, come before me. Knock and I will open the door. We have a God that desires to forgive us. And like the Father, he desires to bring us into fellowship. To restore us. To put us into a right place. David says, a broken spirit and a broken heart, God will not despise. To be repentant requires me to literally be broken. I must be disgusted by my own sin. I cannot wink and nod and say, well, you know, we all do that. It's okay because, you know, I see this other Christian doing it, so it must be okay. We have all ways of making our sins look less. And I'm here to tell you, for true repentance, we, like the prodigal and like David, have to come to the reality that says, there is no excuse for what I did. I am a pathetic sinner. I have failed. I do deserve death. I do deserve punishment. At that point, my heart is broken. My spirit is broken. And my spirit is willing to say to God, I'm not coming here because I'm good. I'm not coming here with a resume saying, you see what I've done for you? How many, how many sermons have I preached, Lord? Yeah. That's got to count for something, doesn't it? No, it doesn't count for nothing. I have to come before God and say, Lord, I am not worthy to be here. I am not worthy to address you. But I do desire to let you heal me, to let you take and wash me clean. And I love what David says in verse 13. Because then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. My friends, you will never hear a more dynamic testimony than a man or a woman who has walked away from God, 
who has experienced true forgiveness, who has been washed clean, and then felt the cleansing of God. You cannot experience that and not want to tell others. There is no way. We talk too much today about keep your Christianity to yourself. I don't want to hear about your Jesus. My friends, this world is in desperate need of hearing about Jesus. And I'm not here to preach them a sermon about my, real, my religion or my theology. What I'm here to do is say, you know what? You're, you've blown it, haven't you? I know you have because I have too. And that means that we were both damned to hell because of our sin. I am not forgiven because I'm a better person than you knew. I am forgiven because I went to God and said, God, I did blow it. And I want to be forgiven. There is no one out there that's beyond God's love. And I, as a Christian, should desire to be one of those people that should tell people there is hope. There is joy in repentance. There is healing in repentance. We see the prodigal son return to his father, expecting to be made a slave. And his father does what instead? He kills the calf, puts a robe and a ring on his finger. He restores him to a position that he has rejected. As a sinner, I am in that position. God called me to not sin, and yet I did. I deserve death because of my sin, and I can honestly say that there is no one out there that deserves hell more than I do. However, I can also tell you that because of God's love, He was willing to take that sin, He was willing to heal me, make me clean and pure, and because of that, I can stand before God, not by my own rightness, but in humility because of His love that says, I forgive in you. That, my friends, is a world that this world need, or this that's a word that this world needs bad. If we can't share the message of the good news of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness, then we are in fact not worthy of being called Christians. If we cannot share with a world that has no hope that Jesus Christ is the hope, that he is the way, the truth, and the light then my friends, we need to lose the term Christian because we have failed to become and live the life he has given us. Not because we're good and holy people, not because of all the good things we've done, but because we've come before our God who was willing to forgive us. We repented in true sorrow and we were made right by his blood. Thank you.